great John Greenwood immediately rejected me. And uh, so that was it. I stuck that copy, I stuck the second copy of that away. And uh, he, he made some very nasty remarks when he sent the rejection back about how many photos I needed to buy for myself and all this kind of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> so two years later, I was working on my flight instructor certificate. And just for the heck of it, I called up Avery Color Studios in Marquette and said, do you accept manuscripts from unpublished authors? And they said, yes. I sent it off. And uh, I didn't know until many years later when Fred Stonehouse told me that that call happened. Avery was in bankruptcy and Ron Avery's daughter was bringing the co company out of bankruptcy. She didn't have an author because Fred had left since they went into bankruptcy. So when I called Anita McCollum, I was her author. And before I knew it, there we were. And uh, I had a book. So, and after that, I had the second book immediately and the third book right after that. And people on the Great Lakes started going, who is this guy? You know, he's got three books on the shelf all of a sudden, where'd he come from? And the fact is I'm from the wrong side of Saginaw, Michigan. And yeah, I flew airplanes for a whole career. And at the same time I was writing books. So uh, that's, that's kind of my history. Uh, you'll have some links that uh, take you to a full page that tell you all about all the books that I wrote and the history behind each one. There's some pretty screwy and funny stuff in there. So I recommend going there and uh, it's called uh, uh, The Backstory. You can read it there. So anyway, uh, here we are now. Uh, I just went through writing two books for Avery on World War II and the Great Lakes. And for those of you right up there on the, the coast of Lake Michigan, you know what a huge part uh, that area played in winning the war. So I tried to document as much of that around the lakes as I could in the first book. And it went so well that uh, Wells, my publisher, came to me and said, we want another book right now. And I went, oh, just came off the shelf, come on. And said, nope, another book right now. So I spent another two years. And this time I had to write about people. And uh, the other time I had pulled the low hanging fruit down. And this time I went for the people and it required a lot more research and uh, a lot more connections, but I managed to make them and uh, ran into some interesting people. I actually uh, had sat next to a uh, Medal of Honor awardee from uh, uh, upper Minnesota. And while I was riding with him, he told me part of his story. And I got back here and went into the Nimitz Library at Annapolis and looked him up. And I got his full story. And so that's in this book. And uh, I was away from shipwrecks a little too long, I think, because uh, my last shipwreck book I wrote concurrently with a six book series on space flight. So that was about seven years between uh, shipwreck books. So I said, okay, that's it. No more World War II books. I'm doing the next one on shipwrecks. And so here I am last beginning last winter, just before the COVID lockdown, just wallowing in my chosen place, my, my comfort zone of shipwrecks. And it was good to be back. And I'm telling you, it is good to be back. And the book was going very well when the lockdown occurred and Avery had to close. The result was a lot of our sales went right into the toilet. So uh, my royalty check for the first half was bad. So anyway, uh, I got a hold of Wells, my publisher, and I said, you know, this book's going really fast. If I knuckle down, we could have the next book out in one year instead of two. And that's what we did. So that book is finished. It's a good book. It's at the uh, editor right now, a guy by the name of Chris Rotiers. Uh, you'll probably see him if you're on Facebook in shipwrecked areas, you'll, you'll see him. Uh, he's a collector. He is the beneficiary of the full, full collection from the great Ralph Roberts, the late Ralph Roberts. And uh, so he's a real good guy to, to have doing this. The book is going to be called The Witch of November. And <laughs> on the cover is going to be some great artwork that is done uh, by a, a nice guy. <laughs> His name is Tony Stubrick, and he does uh, pencil work. And he's doing a custom, he's done actually, a custom picture of the Edmund Fitzgerald sailing along in that storm. So uh, this tends to sell. Okay, anytime you use this, 
it sells. And people always want to know all about the Edmund Fitzgerald. Everybody's written about it. That's not my thing. I, I don't write about the things that everybody's written about. So what I did is I told the publisher, here's what we're going to do. We're going to call this book The Witch of November. And we're going to put the Edmund Fitzgerald on the cover. And then I'm going to do an introduction about the Fitzgerald. And then we're going to go and we're going to cover all of the other wrecks that took place on or about November 10th. And believe it or not, when you look in November, you find that from the 9th through the 11th are the most disastrous days in November. So I could go all the way back to 1835. Instead, I kind of stopped at 1850 and then worked my way up. I did cover the Great Storm of 1913 because you can't, you know, that took place over the November 10th period. You can't do those other wrecks and not touch on that storm. But I did it from a totally different angle. So uh, it's, it's fresh and it's new and, uh, and it doesn't speculate on what happened to those vessels. Speculating is not my thing. I do real truthful stuff, real research. Uh, one of the things we were talking about earlier uh, when we, we prepared for this was about the Christmas tree ship, the Rose Simmons. Now, everybody really who knows anything about Great Lakes Maritime stuff, right? knows about the Rose Simmons. Uh, that's good. It's, it was a good, good wreck. It's a good story. Dwight Boyer wrote it very well. It's one of my favorites when I read his books. I own them all. And uh, he's my favorite author. So uh, the Christmas tree ship. Well, if you look carefully, you find out that there was another Christmas tree ship that was sailed by his older brother, it was called the Estelle. And in 1898, on November 9th, it succumbed to a gale on Lake Michigan. The vessel ended up coming ashore in pieces. The main portion came ashore near, uh, uh, I believe it's, uh, I want to say Glendale, but that's not it, Glencoe. And uh, other wreckage was spread farther south. And so that, that became a minor, minor story in a very big storm in 1898. Minor story. They said there were five that were lost on board. Later accounts actually say there were three. And the brother of the captain of the Christmas tree ship was the captain on this vessel. So no one knows whatever happened to them. No bodies were ever found. The vessel simply washed ashore in pieces, gone. And the lifeboat came ashore also. So they have no idea what happened to these people. Now, in researching that, uh, was a, it's a story I'm going to write separately. <clears throat> in researching that, I found out something really interesting. The uh, company that the family that owned the two Christmas tree ships owned a lot of other vessels. And they were all these rickety uh, 1857 to 1867 constructed vessels that they started to pick up in the late 1800s to run these lumber routes and the Christmas tree routes. There was another one called the Margaret Doll. And it came ashore on November 10th, 1898, the day after the wreckage from Thal came ashore. And it came ashore right there at Glencoe. So now what I'm gonna have to look for is, I wanna know if the other captain of the Christmas tree ship was the captain on that vessel. Wouldn't that be a real interesting twist that the two brothers were wrecked before on the same day. One survived, the other didn't. So that's research I still have to do. And when you're working with a, a little known, eh, you know, tiny wreck that is barely gets a headline in the newspapers among all the other wrecks, it is really difficult to go through and find the names of captains. I've done it before, and I think I'm going to do it again. So anyway, uh, that's a big thing. Is I know the Christmas tree event there in uh, in Door County is huge, as well it should be. And uh, when people talk about the Rose Simmons, remember the Estelle, because she belonged to the same company, and the brother of the captain of the Christmas tree ship was in command of her. 
So that's the kind of work that I do. Uh, I call it going farther. What I do is I go and I look for the details. I look for the overall wreck and whatever happened. And then I go and I look for the detailed details. And I get as much as I can possibly get, everything you can possibly find. And then I search farther. And believe it or not, sometimes if you go a couple of years below, behind or a couple of years ahead, you'll find stuff. In the case of this Christmas tree ship, I went one year ahead and found out that the proper amount of crewmen who were lost was three and not five. So there you are. And uh, that's, that's a good way to do it. Now, what are the research tools that are commonly used? And excuse me, you gotta have, first of all, research tools get a big cup of iced tea. That's number one. Uh, number two, you gotta have a container of Tylenol over here on the shelf, definitely. You gotta have legal pads. That 1898 wreck, this is the first page of stuff from that 1898 wreck that is in the book. So uh, that's kind of where I start. And then if you really are serious about this, you buy a subscription to newspapers.com. Uh, they don't sponsor me or anything like that. I just use them like uh, a cheap prom date. I mean, you know, I really use the daylights out of newspapers.com. And uh, what that allows me to do now that I couldn't do years ago when I first started doing this is I can skip from one city's paper in their maritime column to another all the way on the other side of the lakes or all the way up on the lakes and get different stories or connect stories together. I can also look at vessel passages at choke points around the lakes and I can pick up where vessels were and where they should be and whether or not they got there on time. And sometimes, for instance, in this book, or in this uh, story about the 1898 storm, what I did was uh, I put in vessel passages, but I took one vessel and I put you aboard it. And then I take you down from the Sioux Locks all the way down the St. Mary's River, down Lake Huron to Port Huron. And I tell you about every single vessel that you passed going upbound when you passed them, who the captain was, usually what the cargo is and where they were headed. And that allows you to kind of go back and live that part of the storm. And that's part of my writing technique is drawing the reader into the story so that I'm not really telling you the story, you're there. You're reading what's there. And you feel now like you're a boat nerd in 1898 and you're actually on this vessel. You're actually on the Frank Rockefeller and you're going down the lakes and you're meeting these other boats and these other captains. Plus, I put in the history of each one of those vessels. So you know how much horsepower they had and what their size was, where they were built, and sometimes what happened to them in the end. <clears throat> that takes you into this story of the storm. So it's just one of my techniques for telling people what's going on. I use a lot of uh, weather, uh, and by the way, if, I'm, if you hear me uh, bending over, I'm, I'm going for the Ricola that uh, keeps my voice from quitting on me. Anyway, when I was at Embry-Riddle, I took basic and advanced meteorology. And I found that I had a knack for meteorology. I've always been a weatherhead. I love clouds and reading clouds, and, which comes in handy when you're a pilot. So anyway, uh, advanced meteorology, I had got an A in that, and I actually uh, tutored some of the students in it. Now I come back and I can look at a storm such as the great storm of 1913, and I can see where everybody else who's made accounts of it, they don't know meteorology. They don't know how to read the charts properly. They don't know how to look at the charts, and they don't know how to look outside of the Great Lakes region to see what's going on. Yes, you're waving at me. You're muted. You're yeah. fuzzy. You're you're like out of focus right now. I, am. I don't know why. Yeah. I'll try to stay still. No, like your camera's out of focus. Okay, how bad? I'm seeing myself in focus. Like like I need my to put my glasses on out of focus. <laughs> well, it's a good look for you, you know, it, <laughs> it softens you. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? No. 
My, my camera's autofocus, so uh, hmm. I have to ask anybody else. Uh, Gary, how does he look? How do I look, Gary? Am I out of focus? Hold on. I got to turn you. Uh, yeah. Hold on. Sorry. Dude, uh, unmute again. There you go. Okay, I unmuted myself. I can, yeah, he's a little fuzzy, but I can hear well, him well. That's normally me. <laughs> how about now? <laughs> No, that's right. He's not as clear as he was before. Just a, like say a little fuzzy. You think you need your glasses adjusted. <laughs> it's you probably just the connection, Wes. It's probably the connection because I'm looking at my repeater here on the screen and I'm right in focus. So yeah, well, give it a minute. It'll probably bounce somewhere. All right, just keep I going. Yeah. Just fine. So maybe it's just you. <laughs> yeah, well, you said, you, you know, you don't have that great of a uh, uh, internet capability there. So yeah. All right. Yeah, Paige, you're in focus, but Wes is a little out of focus. Oh, but, see, uh, it's not us, can, Wes. It's you. I can I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> it's Everybody Zoom. That's what it is. It's Zoom. So, all right. Well, uh, I don't have anything printed I'm going to show you anyway, so there we go. Thus, uh, pressing on about the way we do this, um, I, I actually lost where I was. I don't have a script to read from. But... Anyhow, I use a lot of newspapers.com. Uh, it, it keeps me from having to go from city to city. It used to be that I'd go to Saginaw and I'd go into the uh, Hoyt Library there and sift through the Marine columns for a few decades until I got so sore I couldn't sit there anymore. And I'd walk out with a packet this thick of copies of information. And then when I got home, I'd go through them, but it, I felt like I had solid gold in there. You know, you never know what you're going to discover. So now I can do that online and, and that's great. That works quite well. So uh, the end of that is, uh, oh, we were talking about meteorology. That's right. I'm sorry. Um, and the great storm of 1913. Now I'm back on track. See, uh, I may not look 63, but the body says you're 63. Anyway, uh, <laughs> when it comes to meteorology, I can actually go online and I can dig out the daily weather charts for every day of that storm. And what happened was you had two storms that came through in rapid succession. And they actually followed a track down here to the Washington, D.C. area. And they were right here, kind of centered over where I live. When all of a sudden in a 12 hour period, they shoved all the way back up to the northwest. Now, we all know that weather moves from west to east. To see it move to the northwest in that sudden manner is strange. And if you watch on the charts, you'll see that this normally circular storm takes on an oval shape. That's why they had the continuous north winds at such a high velocity, because the pressure gradient was steep, so the winds were stronger, and they were coming out of one direction for a long time because that storm was trapped, because it was trapped between three high pressure systems, one up here, and one over here, and one that came out of the Caribbean. It's called the Bermuda High. You don't see it a lot. Uh, weathermen on TV never mention it. It's there. The Bermuda High is there, and it can affect weather as far as the Mississippi River and as far as Duluth, very easily, if it's strong enough. In this case, the Bermuda High was incredibly strong. Now, I've heard some people say, well, no, there was a uh, upper level low that formed. Now, that's a good theory. We don't have any upper level information. They didn't do weather information from the upper levels. It was all surface level. But if you watch, the Bermuda High on the 12th comes right on shore. So it was affecting this weather all along. And that's what pushed that storm the opposite direction of where they normally go. So that's what strengthened it. That's what made it such a horrible storm. What caused all the, uh, the wrecks? As you know, there are still two wrecks missing from the 1913 storm. They just found one here recently, but there are still two missing. And uh, out of that, that's a, a dozen huge steel lakers just gone, wiped off the face of the earth with one storm. How did that happen? How did 235 mariners just gone? 
Well, it happened not only because of this freak weather, it also happened because captains had an attitude that no wind could blow that would take down one of these boats. That's the problem. They went right into that storm thinking that nothing could save them or nothing could take them down. And then they got out there and found out nothing could save them. So uh, when you look at some of the uh, computer models we have now of what the waves were on Lake Huron, it's amazing. Uh, Lake Huron was devastated by those waves. And uh, when you're talking waves over 30 feet on Lake Huron, that's a rarity. It's an absolute rarity. But the computer models are showing it happened. And you get those little 550 foot steel lakers out there, that's it. And believe it or not, that attitude persisted right up until the time that the Edmund Fitzgerald sank. So you still had cowboy captains that would go out there and just, yeah, nothing can happen to this boat. And off they go. Now, even management will call the vessels and say, take shelter. And a lot of the captains that have come along now are taking shelter freely. And they're not in any, any sort of rush, not like you're gonna lose your job if you don't get the cargo through. So there, there was a lot of plus that came out of the Edmund Fitzgerald wreck. But I like going back and seeing all the other wrecks that uh, occurred. Uh, my publisher asked me, he said, for this book, he says, are there enough? I said, well, if I just look at November 10th in the database, there are 45. He said, if I go to the other two ends on the 9th and the 11th, there's more than 150. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be a good book. We're going to have a lot of pictures, a lot of maps. I'm going to show you some of those weather charts that I talked about. So that's some of the techniques and skills that I use to write the books. Uh, the other thing is, I guess I'm just good at writing them. So people like them. And uh, I like to hear good things about them. Uh, we all have our critics and that's okay. I don't have that many, so I'm kind of lucky. Uh, Mr. Greenwood has passed on, but I have a really fun story about John Greenwood. Uh, this was, I had seven books out at the time and I was still flying the airlines. So I go anywhere I wanted for free. And I was based in Hibbing, Minnesota then. So I had a couple of days off. So I jotted down to uh, Duluth and dropped into the Canal Park Museum, my buddy, Pat Labity. Pat is an expert on wooden shipwrecks, expert on wooden ships of any sort. Just Pat's the guy, he's the oracle. So I dropped into his office and we were talking. And uh, while we're in there chit-chatting, he knows this whole Greenwood thing. While we're in there chit-chatting, his phone rings and he picks it up and he answers and he puts the phone aside. He says, it's John Greenwood. It's like, oh, and he says, watch like that. And he says, hey, John, he says, guess who's in my office right now? And he told him it was me. And he held the phone back. He went, silence. <laughs> so there was silence. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I guess Mr. Greenwood went to his grave regretting that uh, I'm the author. He passed up. But that's the way it goes. So anyway, um, how are we doing on time? We got 34 now. You're muted again, Door County. <laughs> Paige keeps talking to us while she's muted. There you go. Hi. Um, maybe keep going for like another 10. Okay, another 10. Yeah. I gotta think of more stuff to 10, talk about. 10 to 15, 20, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, uh, how do you get published if you got something that uh, you wanna write? There are a number of ways. Uh, I did the self-publishing thing for my space flight book and for my novel. Uh, sales have not been that great. I much prefer the lake boat sales and, and that sort of stuff. But if you want to get the word out, that's a good way to do it. Uh, places such as Amazon, that's the big one. Uh, <clears throat> you can publish there for free. I mean, the hard part about self-publishing is you're going to have to format the text. Uh, I would advise hiring a formatter. There's a lot more of them out there now than there were when I started doing this stuff in, uh, in 2013 uh, for my own book. And the formatters, they'll charge you a few hundred, but it's easier to try and do it yourself. If you go look at their, uh, uh, their 
columns and their chat rooms, you'll find out that 99% of the questions are about formatting errors. So avoid the errors, hire a formatter. The other thing is, remember books are sold by the cover and the title. And people say you don't judge a book by your cover. Ah, no, it's sold by the cover and the title, and primarily the title. So I found out that I stink at titles. So uh, I tried a couple of them at Avery. And, and so anyway, I usually let them title. And that's why you'll see some of my titles and you'll go, Oof, who came up with that? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. So uh, my whole theory in this is the way I look at it is be professional. If you're going to sell a product, make a product you can sell. The first thing you want to do is remember the first rule of authoring. The difference between author and writer is it's done. That's the difference. It's done. Finish it. Write the book, finish the book, sell the book, get the check, write the next one. That's kind of the easy formula to go by. So, and remember, your book will never be good enough for you. It'll always be good enough to sell. So I don't go to seek perfection. Uh, all books will have errors, even though Chris reads my books backward and forward, literally, there's still going to be some errors in there. And it's just one of those things. Uh, I get people that tell me about my novel. It's, well, this is, you have a, a T-O where it should be T-O-O -O or something like that. And, or a, a there where it should be they are. I got one of those. Okay, well, that's fine. I'll take that. I mean, out of 90,000 words, think about sitting down to write 90,000 words. You're not going to get them all right. So uh, even if you go into Webster's Dictionary right now, the big, thick Webster's Dictionary, start going through the pages, you're going to find errors. So, and that's another thing when you're, you're doing newspaper research, you got to remember two things about the old newspapers. Number one, the type was all hand set, one letter at a time, backward, okay? That's the way these old newspapers were made up. Second thing is, there was no internet, there was no wire service. Everything that came through either came through by teletype or by word of mouth. So a lot of the news is offset about two or sometimes three days from when the event actually occurred. So when you see somebody that, or something that says such and such a boat was lost on this day, you gotta figure, well, is it really? Let me go look and find out. In my current book, I found uh, twice that the modern databases actually had the wrong date for when the vessel was lost. So there you go. Uh, it's just a matter of digging farther. So that's, that's kind of what I do. Uh, the other part that I like about doing this, I like the detective work. It's, it's great. I get to do all the fun. You guys just have to read. Uh, the other part of this that I like is, uh, you think Paige has fallen asleep? Oh, okay. Uh, the other part of this that I like is, is meeting the readers, meeting people. And that's why this COVID thing is making me nuts because I'm the type of person, I like to get out at a table with the books. I like to meet the people. I like to chat with them about whatever they want to talk about because I, that's just my personality. I'm the type of guy that I'll stand in the line at the grocery store in the old days before COVID and talk to the person next to me like the, they're my neighbor and I've known them forever and never met them before. So, uh, which really weirds out some people, but it's just me. So uh, that's the kind of thing that I like to do. I like to get out and do that. Um, I like to go hang out at the locks at Sault Ste. Marie or hang out at the, the museums and uh, get a crowd to come in and talk. And then sometimes I get enlightened. I always tell people that a, a good author is like a good lawyer. I don't know everything there is to know about Great Lake shipwrecks. Far from it. Okay, I don't, don't know all there is to know. I, I don't have the memory bank for that, okay? I do a book, the chapter goes in here, it comes out here, it goes there, and it's, boop, you know, see you later, next chapter. So I don't know everything. I don't have it committed to memory, just like a good lawyer. A good lawyer doesn't know the law by memory. They just know where to look to find the answer. And that's what a good research historian and author does. I know where to look to find stuff. So I go and look and I find it. Now, having a few books out with your name on it, that's a pretty cool thing because I can walk into a historical society 
And, and they go, well, the one in, that used to be in Vermillion, I'd walk in there and, and you know, Marge would go, hi, Wes, hi, where have you been for a year? I don't know. Can I go back in the stacks? Sure, because they know I'm not gonna rip them off. They know I'm, I'm not gonna steal any of their material. They know I don't have to be watched and they know I know what I'm doing. So they let me in. Your name can open doors. So uh, that's another good thing. Um, the, the hard part about the going out and doing book signings in bookstores, some bookstores, uh, Barnes and Noble right now is a real pain in the butt because uh, they're all owned independently and nobody has a given policy for author signings. So they're very hard to get into uh, to do a book signing. That's, uh, you'll probably see me at a table at Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, that's a real fun thing. All the shops up there carry my books. And so, uh, you know, I go up there and we get cases of books and we just sign them for folks and off they go. It's, uh, it's a fun thing. All right, I think I've, I've long winded enough. What do you think? Should we try to get some Q and A going here? Yeah. So anybody who has a question, um, we don't have that many Sin folks in Sin the room. Got a question? Just pipe Call up. I do you want to talk about something? I have two questions. First of all, are you having issues getting into places to research with the COVID? A lot of the libraries and stuff are closed. And Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if it's not online right now, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm a swine flu survivor from 2009, which left me with a case of permanent bronchitis. Yeah. So my doctor told me that uh, for me, this COVID thing is, uh, he said, one week from cough to coffin. Okay, mm -hmm. so I stay home. Okay. I stay right here and I look at the bay and I write my books. And uh, if I find something that I'm, I'm gonna have to go and do personal research on, I put it in a later file and I'm gonna go do it later. Okay. So and then I'm hoping that uh, we'll get out of these restrictions. Are you familiar with the Golden Bookstore down in Milwaukee? No, uh, I've been to Milwaukee a few times, but I'm not familiar with that. Is it is it fairly new or? Uh... No, he's been around for a while. I, I'm sure he's in Milwaukee, it might be Madison, but it's Golden Books. He's a small, I think his first name is Stephen. He's a small bookshop and he would love to have you come in and do book signings. He does a lot of that stuff. I mean, uh, obviously. Tell him to contact me. I mean, uh, my email address is really hard. It's you want to put it Wes Olszewski okay. at gmail.com. Olszewski? Yeah, my whole name, Wes Olszewski at okay. gmail.com. There's no doubt, it's just Wes all, one word? Yeah, one word. All right, thanks. Yeah, and uh, my personal uh, address for selling books, since I can't be in places to autograph books right now, I formed a website that uh, I have a stock of books here now, and if somebody wants to buy one and have me sign it or personalize it to somebody or whatever, uh, you go there and it comes right to the, this desk here. I take the book off the shelf. I sign it. I do whatever you say to it. And it goes out by priority mail. So they get their books in a hurry and they get it personalized by me. Um, that's a, an offshoot of the COVID thing. It makes it easier now for people to buy the stuff and, uh, and keeps my fans in touch. So uh, that's and the, the address for that is really hard. It's authorwes.com. When I went to register that, I couldn't believe that author Wes wasn't taken. So it's authorwes.com. That's me. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, I think it's, it's that Cindy to everyone, the Titanic was unsinkable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good example. <clears throat> Yeah, you were talking about the cowboy pilots and, I, and about how they didn't think anything could be blown out of the water. And then that was why when they built the Titanic, they said it was unsinkable. Well, look what happened at its first night voyage. <laughs> yep. So, you know, there you are. Yep. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I haven't done anything on the Titanic at all other than do some reading up on it. So that's another one of those that it's just been hammered to death. And, and the problem is a lot of times uh, the people that are uh, spewing out stuff are not the ones who are doing the deep research on it. It's the same thing with the, uh, the fits. Um, I'm, I've got a, a YouTube site 
and I'm going to be doing a video on the, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And uh, everybody asks, what's my opinion? What's my opinion? Uh, primarily so some of them can argue with me. But um, the first problem is that, number one, the Canadian charts for that area, the Canadian chart for that area, there's only one, was out of date. And I think the last time it was updated was about 1918. So Chummy Bank, they had listed in the wrong place. So the Canadians have their butts hung out on that. Okay, the next problem is the U.S. Coast Guard. I uh, have all the respect in the world for the people at the Coast Guard. But when you go into the very upper ranks in management, what you find out is in 1974 and 75, their budgets were being strangled. So they decided they were going to start, oh, I don't know, let's, let's make some of these lighthouses automated. What the heck? We don't have, we take people off it. And when they came to the Whitefish Point Lighthouse, and, uh, and directional radio beacon. The Lake Carriers Association protested loudly about that. Yep, did it anyway. And they said, well, what if the power goes out? Oh, we have a generator there that'll automatically trigger. Well, yeah, when the generator's in four feet of water, kind of hard for it to work. And they hadn't estimated that a wave may come ashore that was that deep, <laughs> So, or waves. So. The lighthouse was extinguished. The radio beacon, radio direction beacon was out. So also the Coast Guard didn't have any assets that they could deploy. The nearest aircraft they had was in Travers and that was on a one hour call. So it would take them one hour to get off the ground. It would take them another 25 or 30 minutes to get to the site. Also, <clears throat> when they went to the site, there was no such thing as a rescue swimmer. Rescue swimmers weren't even created until the mid 80s. So if they got there and found people in the water with the C-130, there's nothing they can do for them. Big problem there, Coast Guard. The only vessel they had that could go out in the seas like that was in Duluth. And it was being worked on. They only had one engine running. <clears throat> Other than that, you look at Sault Ste. Marie, they had nothing there. They could go out onto Lake Superior in that kind of weather. So a lot of people in a lot of areas politically had their buns on the line. <clears throat> I always say, if you want to know what happened to the Fitz, watch the video of Captain Cooper. He was there. I've been out sailing with those guys. They know that lake. They know all these lakes. They know every inch of these lakes. And if he says the Fitz went over that shoal, the Fitz went over that shoal. So <clears throat> another point that he makes in his video is that uh, the, she had a fence down. That's the uh, wire railing that goes along the spar deck. Now those are designed with cables in them so that they can bend and twist the entire vessel and it can even hump and sag and the wires stay intact. What happens to take a fence down? You have to hog. A lot to take a fence down. But he had a fence down. He didn't say I have my fences down. He had a fence down. And he was doing fine until he crossed that shoal area. 15 minutes after that, he had a list. All of his pumps were on. He had a fence down and he'd lost some vents. And he said the waves were bigger than he'd ever seen. He was sinking after he passed that shoal. Why do you have a fence down? Because he hit the shoal and that side of the vessel hogged and it snapped those wires. That's all the evidence you need. Well, no, maybe we need more. You know what we need to do? We need to go out there around Chummy Bank and send down an ROV or something and look for taconite or look for hull plates. Look for that kind of evidence. Guess what? Canadian government won't allow it. But they did, after the wreck, update their chart a little bit. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that surrounds the Fitzgerald. Uh, she did not break in half. There's no record ever of a fully loaded lake freighter, especially a steel freighter, breaking in half. Never has a steel freighter broken in half in seas. A composite one did. I wrote that story. 
but she had a wood bottom with iron, iron railings inside. So iron frames, wood bottom, iron sides. Yeah, okay, she broke in half with a load on board. I'll take that right to the bank, no problem. Now, Dwight Boyer wrote in his 1913 storm stories that uh, one of the captains that was out in the storm said he saw the uh, hydras go down. So saw her break in half, crumple like an egg and go down. Well, they found the hydras recently. Guess what? She's intact. She didn't break in half. So where did the story come from? Well, I happen to have that captain's account of the story that he sent to the Lake Carriers Association and his management after the storm. He mentions every detail of being in that storm and says nothing about seeing the hydras. Nothing. So where'd that come from? That was pretty easy. Dwight Boyer is a great author. I love him. I love his writing. But he authored in the 60s. In the 60s and early 70s, you could tell a Great Lakes story and you could embellish or you could even make up things. If you notice in his work, he always uses the full name of crew members that were lost. I've been doing this for over 30 years. You rarely find the full name of every crew member that's lost. If you find two that you have their full name, you're doing good. So what does it tell you? He made up the names too. He had to have names and he made them up. Why? Well, who's going to go back and check him? <laughs> who's going to find that wreck? Okay. Who's going to find the hydras? They'll never find the hydras. They'll just put that in there. It's pretty dramatic, right? So he did. And it's just, it's an, an, an artistic license that guys like Boyer and Bowen used. And I don't blame them for that. That's, that's part of telling a good story. They were telling a good story. They told me a good story. I liked it. And then I found out later that, well, some of it is baloney. Okay. You know, that's, that's it. It's just the era in which it was written. Just like the newspaper stories. A lot of that is hogwash. It's just the era in which it was written. So there we are. Any other questions? Come on, come on. <laughs> I'm, I've been looking at Bob Ellison all night. He's, he's looking like he's falling asleep. <laughs> what you got what you got there eric you gotta unmute yourself unmute eric please you have to go. find the right button sorry um i know my picture looks kind of creepy it's weird lighting right where i am um, <laughs> <That's> awesome ah! <laughs> um halloweenish kind of as you say um i'm a writer i would like to get to the point of being an author what it, like you said going into a lot of these places and oh hi wes yeah go ahead go on back how do I get to the point of them saying, yes, you can access some of this stuff? I would say you actually have to have about two books out, about okay. two. Uh, at the time when I started doing that, I had five. And then it's just, <laughs> okay. you know, I, my name is easy to recognize. Uh, once you go in there once, and usually if you take one of your books and I, in my contract, I get X amount of author's copies just to give away. And I use them to bribe sources. So I use them to bribe people like that. You go in there and you, you know, you talk to the person in charge and you say, well, you know, I'd like to donate one of my books to your library and you autograph it to the library and give it to them. Gold. Now you get the key to the city. So, and that actually worked at the Naval Academy. Um, wow. It's before 9-11. And when you could actually just drive onto the Academy grounds and go up to the Nimitz Library and park in the parking lot. And uh, I went there so many times, I got to the point where the guy at gate two would just salute me and say, so long, you know, like that. So, uh, but I donated one of my books to uh, their library and uh, they gave me a library card. And so I never even had to use it. The people at the desk knew me so well. It was like, yeah, I got another stack of copies, you know, or I need to use a copy machine. Here's the key. So, uh, but you have to have a few books in publication to get that done. Okay, okay. Well, then I'm gonna ask, uh of Paige. Can I come up and see you sometime and hopefully try and get toward that two books? <laughs> um, yes, you know, and I was going to add to Wes's um, comments here at the Maritime Museum, you know, we've got a pretty extensive archive. Um, in fact, my office is adjacent to it. Um, and we have volunteers that sort of do 
like a kind of a cooperative work thing. You know, people that are working on maybe their first or second novel, they come in and help our curator with scanning photos into our system and, and labeling things. So it's sort of a two for one. You're doing research and you're also helping us at the museum, which then makes us uh, willing to let you let you into our books, into our archives too. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Very good. Very good. So hopefully I can come up. We just closed our place. Um, my parents have a cottage just south of Sturgeon Bay. Yeah. We just Absolutely. closed it up. My sister left this morning to go back to Minnesota after they turned everything off for the winter. Is that it? A part of that um, also, the, part of that also, Eric, is uh, you have to be a good citizen too, because uh, I know there are people that'll go in there and they'll swipe stuff, and uh, oh. it's uh, yeah, you can't have that. It just soils all of us. So uh, that's that's a big part of it, and uh, I'm sure Paige can tell you that you, there are some people you need to watch like a hawk. So uh, yeah. that's kind of the way that that, that goes. Um, but uh, and the other thing is. Uh, I make connections with collectors, collectors and divers, the most paranoid people mm -hmm. in the world. Okay. <laughs> the KGB is not as paranoid as wreck divers. <laughs> so uh, that was a tough earning way. Uh, what I had to do is I had to earn the trust of these divers. As a result, now I know secrets I got to take to my grave because uh, some of these guys have told me things about wrecks and where wrecks are and, and what they've done on wrecks that I just can't use. Now, collectors, on the other hand, are extremely paranoid. And what you have to do to get in, go to the collector is every time you meet with them, you take something in tribute. It's either a, a book from your collection or some photos that you've taken yourself. And you give them something in tribute and collectors will let you come into their world for a while, but man, they watch you like a hawk. I'm not kidding you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Gary, you look like you you got a question on your uh, on your mind there. Oh, well, I just have a comment. Um, yeah. When you when you mentioned that you uh, sold through Avery Studio in Upper Michigan. Yeah. I just recall that I used to sell their books and some of your books as well between, I don't know, in the 90s and the early 2000s. And I still have a few of them, but I can't remember their titles. But I had Frederick Stonehouse come to my studio, uh, my shop for a book signing one time. And that was really fun. Yeah, uh, Fred is my mentor. And when my yeah, first he's... book came out, uh, he, um, you know, Fred, he's, he, there's no filter there on Fred. Okay. He just, oh, this is genuine you know, guy. If you don't want to hear my opinion. Don't ask. Right. Right. So, uh, uh, we're, we're a lot alike in that way. But anyway, when my first book came out, it was out and it was being published. And uh, Avery told me that Fred had read it and he had some criticisms. And I was like, Damn. You know? <laughs> so I said, give me his number. So they gave me his phone number and, uh, uh, I called him up. I think it was in Fenton that he was living in then. But anyway, I called him up. He answered the phone and we had a talk. And every criticism he had was completely constructive and correct. <clears throat> and you can tell the difference between my first book and my second book by that conversation with Fred. Really? And after that, you know, if, if I want to know the, the poop on something and what's going on, even with Avery, uh, I'll Get a hold of Fred first, and I'll say, "What do you, you heard anything? What do you know?" And uh, and he'll tell me. So uh, he's uh, lately has been doing a lot of the cruise ship stuff, oh. and uh, I have to blame him for that because uh, I was doing the cruise ship stuff in 2000 and 2001, and Fred came aboard in 2001, and there I was like, "Hi, Fred. <laughs> Guess how much I'm getting paid to do this? You know, <laughs> cruises pay well, okay." Oh, you mean anyway, you were a guest on the cruise ship for... Uh, no, I was uh, went aboard as uh, hired as uh, their um, enhancement speaker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 375 a day plus expenses. Nice. And I had to give three one-hour speeches. And oh, wow. so I told them, I said, that's, that's not enough. And they said, what? I said, let me be your guide. You know, I'll just put me on the PA. I'll tell people where we are. I'll walk the decks. People can ask me questions about the lakes and yeah. stuff, and I'll be your guide. 
And so I did that and it helped me pass the time a lot better, but I'll warn you those cruise ships, man, if you're on them for a week or two, I was on the, the, uh, the old sea Columbus, which is now, I think the Bremen, uh, I was on that for two weeks and Mm. I ballooned up in weight because the food is just so delicious and so yeah. much of it. And you have to always eat with the guests. You know, you can't like stay in your cabin and, and not eat. <laughs> uh, and I swear to God, I rode that extra cycle from one end of Lake Superior to the other. And I didn't lose a pound. I ended up going on Weight Watchers when I got home. Yeah. So uh, that's the one thing I would warn about <laughs> when it comes to the cruise ships. I hear you there. But if you get a chance to go on one of those, do it uh, a lot of times they'll take you into places that uh, you yeah. haven't been or you'll see lighthouses that you normally wouldn't see uh, it's a good angle to see lake boats from it's fun to sail under the Mackinac bridge and uh, it's fun to uh, go up the St. Mary's river and through the locks and, and that sort of stuff so it's a lot of fun uh, the only yeah. place that they went that I, I didn't like was uh, Thunder Bay there was nothing there but a casino so you know you had the the docks and some boats but there's really nothing there but a casino they don't even have a museum there when i was there so yeah my wife Uh, and i went on one last uh november of 2019 from venice uh around through the adriatic sea and greece and and through the islands at the boot of italy so that was very cool to go that's that's nice uh it, it was fun being uh being the enhancement speaker and the guide. I, I really liked it. Um, oh, I would have been at every lecture. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the funny part was at the end of that cruise, uh, the very last couple of days, this woman came on board. <clears throat> I don't know who she was, but she was running around with the guy that uh, owned the company that sponsored these cruises. And so we're going through the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. It was foggy. We're going up the St. Mary's River at night. And they didn't know it but I had my scanner on and I was plugged in one ear through my jacket and listening to the lock master. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and Sioux control. And so uh, a thousand foot of the got was coming down and going to pass us. And I knew right where the got was. And so I turned to the crowd that was out there on the, the bridge wing there. And I said, okay, there's a thousand footer coming and he's going to come out of the fog right about now. And I pointed like that and he loomed out of the fog, right? Nice. So then we come up to the lock <laughs> and the red light's on. There's a, they have a red and a green light down there. I'll let you know whether or not you should come into the lock. So we come into the lock or come toward the lock and the red light's on and we start to slow down and stop. And I hear the lock master talk to Gus, who was our pilot. And he says, okay, Gus, we're going to give you the green right now. I said, okay, there's that red light right there and it's going to turn green about now. <laughs> it turned green <laughs> we went through so uh the next morning i had breakfast with her and she says well my company has two vessels that are going to be coming here next summer and i want you on all of our cruises and i said this is how much i make a day and she said i don't care i want you on our cruises and i'm thinking new van right <laughs> oh boy and uh now that was in uh uh 2001 and just prior to that, the Twin Towers had come down and the economy crashed. And those two vessels are still sitting down in Louisiana rotting. So there went that job. Bummer. <laughs> but it would have been fun. Thank you, Wes. I better run. Okay. I think our, our hour is uh, up. So. Does anybody else want to ask a one more question, one more comment, anything before we sign off tonight? Oh, wait a minute, I got one here. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about how the freighters of the late 19th century, early 20th century kept getting bigger without having properly sized power plants and uh, additional uh, causes for shipwrecks? Yeah, uh, that happened in the early 90s. The size of power plants mushroomed and they got real powerful so they could pull barges. This, you had big steel freighters pulling big steel barges. And the size kept growing, but the standard size triple expansion steam engine stayed pretty much where it was until the, um, in the 30s, then you started to see the, the turbo steams coming in. And then in the 50s, more and more of those. But still, a lot of those big 600 footers had the same triple expansion steam engine. And the horsepower hadn't increased much at all. Why that happened? 
part economics, mostly economics probably, because uh, to develop a larger engine would require a lot of engineering, you got to pay for that. Otherwise, you can just go to the same guys that built the engine that you had a decade ago and say, build us another one. I know, I know how much it costs. I know how to install it. I, I've got guys here who can work it. There we go. And that's pretty much how that happened. Um, another, another cause of sinkings in the uh, early years, uh, uh, one of the many causes, is the lack of good weather. All they had really in the 1800s and up to the early 1900s were ground reports that came from first from the army and then later from the department of agriculture so these reports were given at stations twice a day so they didn't have continuous weather and there were not trained observers there all they were told is give us the barometric pressure give us the wind speed wind direction and whether or not it's raining what the sky cover looks like that's it five things so <laughs> then when it got to the, the uh, weather bureau they had a standardized book for, if you see this front, it should do this. That was it. And you flip from one page to another and said, okay, well, this is what it's gonna do now. And that was the forecast. Unfortunately, for the Great Lakes region, through most of the 1800s, there was this huge gap out to the West. They called that the Indian territories for a while. There were no reporting stations out there, none. So weather could form over the Great Plains out there and you wouldn't even know about it. It could skid down from Canada into that area and start coming to the east. You wouldn't know about it until it got almost into uh, Wisconsin. So there you are. Uh, those, that's one of the big issues. Another one is navigation equipment. There, keep in mind, there was no real radar on these vessels until after World War II. So most of the uh, moving in fog was done by the ear. People blew fog signals and the watchman and the captain had the windows down and they were listening and that's where they thought the vessel was coming from. And oftentimes they did not check down. Another thing was uh, until the uh, early 1900s, they had not formed traffic lanes that were required. So, there were no lanes that the Lake Carriers Association said, this is the downbound lane course, this is the upbound lane course, they have to be this far apart. They call them prescribed courses. And uh, those prescriptions for those courses to this day supersede the navigation rules of the road internationally. So what you see on the salt water doesn't always apply to the lakes because we have prescribed courses across the lakes. So uh, people deviating from those courses made a problem and then people setting their own courses uh the 1896 uh coast pilot has suggestions for the shortest route to get from here to there but it's one route on one compass heading and all the boats are supposed to take it do that in a fog or a, or a snowstorm and see what happens especially when you got zillions of vessels out there so <clears throat> that, i think that would answer that question and thanks for that. Uh, Leslie Robbins gave me that question. Thank you, Leslie. So uh, anything else? Yeah, I just want to say you, you said something about the Titanic that's been written at nauseum, but I think it would be really interesting to find a particular story of somebody that was on the ship. Ooh, there is one. There is one. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Let me see if I can find his book real quick. Um, but there were a lot of people on the Titanic, so. Yes, but there was a guy, and I can't, can't remember his name right at this second, but uh, he was, you'll see a lot of his drawings, pen and ink drawings of vessels on the lakes. Stanton, that was his name, Stanton. <clears throat> and uh, he was big time on the lakes. Uh, he was the pen and ink artist on the Great Lakes. And when he heard about the Titanic, this new unsinkable vessel, he happened to be in the UK. And he bought a ticket on the Titanic just so he could say he was on this wonderful vessel as it crossed the Atlantic. He was lost on the Titanic. Huh. So uh, that's Stanton, that was his name. You'll see his drawings a lot, a lot in historical things. I'm amazed that name popped out of my brain. I'm really bad with names. Anything else? Thanks, that was very interesting. Okay. Hey everybody. Uh,
as we sign off, our next um, Maritime Speaker Series is Thursday, November 3rd, 7 p.m. Stuart and Teresa Fett are going to talk about the history of base shipbuilding. And if we could, before we all sign off, if you could unmute yourselves, we could give Wes a round of applause or a silent round of applause. Blue clap. Golf clap. Golf clap. Or a raspberry will do. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. <laughs> yep. Now make sure you look up my websites. Uh, I've got uh, lakeboats.blogspot.com. And uh, I think Door County is going to publish those somewhere. So you should be able to find that. I, I sent those to Paige. And also my uh, Facebook, or not my Facebook, my uh, YouTube page. I did a whole series on whalebacks that's uh, very technically correct. And I think you'll really like it. So, uh, and I got another series coming on uh, the, the monitor vessels of the Great Lakes, which is really neat. So, uh, all right, folks. Well, you're all dismissed now from class, and uh, <laughs> you may you may go home and uh, and continue boat watching until the end of the season. Good night. Good night. Bye. -bye.